Today's episode of the Sensory Friendly Solutions Podcast on the Unsettled Media Podcast Network is brought to you by Sensory Friendly Solutions. Discover sensory friendly solutions for daily life. To learn more, head to sensoryfriendly.net. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the podcast. Welcome to episode five of the Sensory Friendly Solutions podcast. Number five, this is the halfway mark of our first season together. Our guest today is Carol Stock Kranowitz. As a music, movement, and drama teacher for 25 years, Carol observed many out of sync preschoolers. To help them become more competent in their work and play, she began to study sensory processing and sensory integration theory, SI theory. She learned to help identify her young students' needs and to steer them into early intervention. In writings and workshops, she explains to parents, educators, and other early childhood professionals how sensory issues play out and provides fun and functional techniques for addressing them at home and school. She's best known for her book, The Out of Sync Child, which has sold over 1 million copies and her subsequent series, The In Sync Child. We give you Carol Stock Kranowitz for episode five of the Sensory Friendly Solutions podcast. Carol, welcome so much to the Sensory Friendly Solutions podcast. This is episode five of the podcast, and we feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here, Matt. Carol, for those who aren't familiar with your work, and I'm sure many of our readers and listeners will be, can you explain in a nutshell what you do? (laughs) Yes. Uh, What I do right now is I I write and I speak about sensory processing disorder, and that's something Mm. I learned about uh, over the years as a preschool teacher at a school that was for uh, typically developing children as well as children with, with developmental delays and other special needs. And uh, I learned from the start that the children with the braces and the wheelchairs uh, and the hearing aids were, mm. were great kids to be teaching they were eager to learn they were in the thick of things mm-hmm. uh, uh, it was the the other children who didn't seem to be enjoying their occupation of childhood that uh, that puzzled me they had no discernible disabilities and yet they would stand back from the finger paint or the mud pies or they would uh, tip over the bin of toys and take off their shoes and socks and walk through the Legos, or they would uh, they would behave in very unusual ways. And those were the kids that interested me. And I learned about sensory processing challenges, and that's what I f- figured other teachers and parents needed to know about too. I can't wait to dig into your career arc and how you came about some of the ideas that you've been, you've been publishing. You're quite prolific, but I wanted to introduce when I was reading your bio, I had a really fascinating conversation with an occupational therapist who lives with autism in California named Bill Wong. And Bill gave a really fascinating Ted talk. It's had, I think 22,000 something views already. And he talks about his, his early life. And in the beginning, Bill had said that folks were reluctant to diagnose him with autism because of his high IQ all through school. But then he started to learn through his education about how autistic children learn and how they play and the differences that you're mentioning. And Bill said, I really see myself in in these kids. This was my experience. And then he pursued um, a deeper dive into his neurodiversity and was eventually as an adult diagnosed with autism. So it's fascinating that there are these patterns that you can see even in youth and at things like play. 
Definitely. And the patterns are are exactly what I hope that parents and teachers will begin to observe. Uh, I, I hope that people will learn how to be detectives and uh, uh, put on their sensory spectacles and mm. and uh, look for those patterns. Would you like me to talk about those now, uh, Matt, or do you? Can we first, Carol, with your permission, can we first take a, take a quick step back before sure. we really get in to the good stuff? And let's just do, let's just do a check-in with the current moment. I've, I've asked our, our guests to reflect on the current moment. I release a stat every once in a while that says, as of June 2020, sensory overload was being searched over 40,000 times a month on Google. And that might not seem like a lot as a number, but what really got us paying attention was it was an increase of 50% on the past yeah. year, according to Google Trends. And so I'm wondering, what is, what's the current moment teaching us about sensory overload and what has been your experience of the current moment, especially being in America? Yes, um, I am... I'm no longer in the fray. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm, I'm retired now, so so I um, I know about this anecdotally. But uh, um, but my understanding is that there is extreme heightened anxiety among mm. children. There is uh, what parents are complaining about is acting out, and these are reg these are regulated kids. Uh, typically developing kids who are um, behaving erratically. Um, mm. I, uh, I know from a, a, one experience I had uh, in, the, in the spring, in April of 2020, I was uh, helping out through um, a, a medium like, like Squadcast uh, to help an occupational therapist in Denver, working with a bunch of preschoolers, and we were trying to entertain them with games and movement experiences and songs. And these children, um, it was just very difficult for them to attend to a two-dimensional screen, even though kids have more experience than we want with, with computer screens even though they had experience with it, what they don't have is the real teacher and the the right. proximity of the of their classmates. So everything that is um, under the surface is exposed now. All of the propensities a little body might have to um, <sighs> Uh, to be dysregulated right it's all coming out now so right. so i i'm not because i'm not in the classroom i can't tell you i can't be I can't be so fact based from my own experience mm. but i certainly i certainly see it i hear i I see it through other people's eyes. I hear about it as this dis dissolution of of how children are um, it, their ability to attend and to keep, to be self regulating is mm. being destroyed by this COVID. I love what you say about being exposed in some way. It's it's all coming to the surface now, and this is. Isn't this true of so many different things in this moment? Um, we're starting to understand the frailty of some of the things that we've built. Yeah. And COVID has exposed that within us. And I really, like you say, you talk about e-learning and learning online. I really feel for families right now because like you say, this is a this is a challenging period. I was in a one of our coastal towns and and rural high speed internet access is a problem in my region. And I was in a cafe doing work as I as I as I typically do as an internet-based entrepreneur and I saw a mother and daughter scrambling to get connected to the internet on the cafe um just a few minutes before classes would start 
Mom was clearly late for something, whether it was work or otherwise. And being that they were in the cafe means that high-speed internet access was either too expensive or not available for this family. And it was really, you could see that it was traumatic for both. They were frustrated with each other. Mom was flustered because she wasn't used to the tech. Um, I just really have a, have a, have a heart for families right now and for people, um, experiencing sensory overload. Oh, yes. I'm so sympathetic too. Yeah. And, and Carol, what are, what are your reflections on what is it do you think we're experiencing in this moment? And I don't, I don't, I don't intend for you to, to speak as an expert, but I love hearing the reflections that people are considering in this moment because we're all kind of reflecting together are we do we have this heightened sense of anxiety and awareness because we're we're almost too tuned in we're being bombarded with the news we're being bombarded with media what are we all going through right now as a collective yeah uh, that's that's definitely part of it uh we are bombarded and of course children and dogs will pick up on the anxiety of Mm -hmm. their owners. (laughs) Um, uh, um, Little babies will sense that as well as three-year-olds and eight-year-olds. So so we're we're bombarded with, we're on overload in, in, that way that our, our our sensory system is get is seeing and hearing too much news um, but there's another thing that is the absence of the uh, stimuli that we need so while mm-hmm. we're getting too much of what we don't need and can't process and can't use we're we're n- with uh, with the uh, social isolation being in doors much more than ever is really bad for us because nature nature has designed us to move and and we're supposed to be outside i mean you know if you think it's been a very short time it's been a blink of the eye in evolutionary terms for people to be indoors and have heat and shelter and food easily provided we're supposed to be out there looking for it Building it, right. collecting, right. cooking it, and um, so sitting is not what we're designed to do. So even more sitting these days has to be detrimental to the developing child, and the and the social part of it, I think, is the very worst. Mm. We have um, my husband and I have tried to play a rummy card game with friends online. And it sort of works, but it's nowhere close to being at a table with of with course. your friends holding a fistful of cards. You know, it multiply that a million times toward snack time and circle time and playground time and story time and all of that. All of those opportunities are being deprived our child of our children. Right, right. You mentioned movement being such a critical aspect of the development of a child. And I know we're all feeling this. We're all feeling this in our lower backs and our shoulders of sitting all day and staring at a screen. And I I do agree with you. I think you lose something, don't we? Yes, definitely. Right. Carol, do you mind very quickly tracing your career arc for us? I'm so interested in how you found yourself where you are right now. I know you, you mentioned you've stepped away from the fray and you're focusing on things like writing at this point in your life and we'll get to your, your best selling books, but how did you end up here? What was, what piqued your interest in this field and and when did you start running with it? I, I guess I'm really an odd duck, Matt, because, uh, Likewise. <laughs> uh, my, my interest in teaching was very, minimal. I, I didn't, I wanted to be a writer and, um, was an English major at college and, um, uh, got married, had two little boys who are typically developing people. And they went to a wonderful nursery school in the neighborhood. And one day I, I, uh, 
said to the director, do you need a movement teacher? Because at the time I was doing a lot of uh, dancing. And she said, yes, why don't you come and, and teach? And I said, well, gosh, great. But, you know, I'm not a teacher. I don't have any education in education. And she said, oh, that's okay. You'll learn on the job. So it was the kind of, it was an independent school and there were no uh, requirements at that time. This was in the 70s. So I started teaching and immediately began to notice these kids who uh, were not in sync with the other children. They would back away from the activities that the other kids enjoyed. Their feet never left the ground. Or, or on the other hand, maybe their feet were always off the ground. Maybe they were constantly swinging and constantly climbing on bookcases and jungle gyms. And, I mean, they were not doing the typical things that other preschoolers were doing. So for 10 years, I asked questions. Why, is, why, is, why won't that kid ever um, use glue or finger paint? Why does that kid have his hands over his ears every time I strum the guitar? And I, you know, I wasn't great at <laughs> playing the guitar, but you wouldn't <laughs> typically run out the door when I strummed and there were some kids who, who would complain bitterly from my playing the guitar. Um, well, the other teachers, the experienced ones didn't have answers for me. And at, mm -hmm. at this time, um, uh, ADD, ADD and ADHD were just beginning to come on the horizon. Uh, so we were trying to figure out, well, do these children have attentional problems? But no, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they sometimes they would not pay attention, but other times they were deeply involved in something that interested them very much. ADD did not fit. Mm. Um, I'm coming to the end of this uh, little story. It's great. Uh, ten years after I started teaching, it was in the mid '80s. A, a pediatric occupational therapist volunteered to give the teachers at this preschool a um, a workshop on sensory processing disorder. Mm -hmm. And in those days, it was called sensory integration dysfunction. And we didn't know what that was, but. Uh, we trusted her. So she came and she gave this 90 minute workshop and it blew me away. It was totally answering my questions. And I, so I learned about the three main sensory systems that uh, very young children build all their future learning and behavior on. And those, one of those senses I knew about, the tactile or touch system and that explained kids who would pull away from messy play or um, mm -hmm. uh, fine motor activities that required them to use their hands or these were picky eaters who didn't want certain textures or temperatures of food in their mouths I understood the tactile system, and this was my introduction to the vesti vestibular system, which is um, receptors are in our inner ear, and uh, those uh, the vestibular mm -hmm. system tells us where our head is in relation to the surface of the earth. And the mm. inner ear tells us how fast we're moving and whether we're falling, and are we going up or down? Are we... Are, are we standing up? Are we lying down? All of that is um, our messages coming from the vestibular sense. And the third important sense is the proprioceptive sense. That's the sense of our muscles and joints telling us what our body position is. Are we flexing or stretching? Are we lifting something heavy or light? Are we reaching accurately for the apple juice pitcher or are we knocking it over um are we pulling a hairbrush through our hair uh, mm. 
Uh, are we pulling the seat belt out from the side of the car accurately? Those are uh, functions that we can perform with a good proprioceptive test. So I learned these three senses are very important. And of course, I was so excited and became this therapist's disciple. And I said, give me stuff to read. And she said, there isn't anything to read. Hmm. So um, another decade went by and I learned what I could from, um, from studying occupational therapists' evaluations of young children with the children's names blacked out. And I learned uh, about kids who had sensory challenges, and it was so hard to read it and to understand it. And so I became driven to write something that people like me could understand. And that's the... That's the trajectory of my career. So in 1998, mm -hmm. I was able to find a publisher, and The Out of Sync Child was published in 1998, and it has sold more than a million copies, and it's been translated into, gosh, I think it's 14 languages now. The most recent one was Spanish. Um, Excellent. And uh, I am very, very proud to have introduced this topic worldwide because about 16% of people everywhere of all ages have sensory issues that really, really interfere with their functioning in daily life. And my book has helped. I love this idea that you wrote something that filled a gap in the market that you personally were interested in filling for your own growth. And I think lots of those projects end up being bestsellers because they resonate with so many when we now realize that, okay, yes, there should be material that can be consumed by anybody, whether neurotypical or otherwise, to understand some of these issues and these, these statistics, 16% of people anywhere dealing with sensory issues. That's a heck of a lot of people. And so a resource like this coming out, I think you're right, pays dividends for many. And if I may read one of the blurbs you, you received from the New York Times, the Ed of Sync Child has become the parent's Bible to sensory processing disorder. Are you hearing from a lot of parents that are consuming this material and it really helping them in their family growth? Oh, yes, const constantly, constantly. And, um, you know, it's not just the 16% who are people who's sensory issues are significant enough to warrant therapy. But it's many, many more people. It's like you and me, Matt, who occasionally um, uh, have some sensory overload or sensory underload. Um, I think my book explains how the neurological system works in, in layman's terms. And then... And then we can see, oh, that's why I don't want to go on the roller coaster. Mm. Because my vestibular system says that kind of up and down rapid movement through space is making my vestibular system really, really uncomfortable. So uh, I think the book helps people understand a, a lot of um, our everyday sensory processing. And we all, you know, we all are out of sync from time to time. Think particularly when you've, you've had the flu or when you've been on a very rocky uh, boat or yeah. a very rapid elevator in a very tall building and uh, you feel a little nauseated by that perhaps or... Mm -hmm. um, I have some tactile issues. I really don't like my hands to get gooky. So um, I don't bake bread. I don't garden. It just makes me very uncomfortable to get my hands all gooky like that. Mm. Does that mean that I have sensory processing disorder? No, I don't. 
um, because I can simply arrange my life so I don't bake bread and garden. Um, if, however, those were the only occupations open to me, <laughs> bread baking, right. gardening, and I had this um, this sensory dysfunction, I would be I'd be hard pressed to earn earn a living. And uh, so, you know, we all have some sensory stuff, but it doesn't uh, doesn't usually interfere with how how we get along in life. So I think my book my book has helped the parents. Uh, so many, I can't tell you how many parents have said, "This book explains my child," and I also see how it explains myself. Because mm. um, a question is how does how do sensory issues emerge? Um, well, they're either hereditary, so we either get get it from our parents or our grandparents, or or it's environmental, which means, um, um, well, in babies, babies who are premature often have sensory issues, and they're um, they spend weeks, perhaps, in the neonatal intensive care unit, which is not natural. They they're not getting enough skin contact with at at mommy's breast they're not mm -hmm. um, being cuddled and held and lifted and moved from the crib to the carriage to the stroll you know to the backpack <laughs> um they're uh they're wired and they're on their backs and they're helpless so many of those babies will develop sensory issues as a result of of early hospitalization, or kids who are institutionalized, say they come out right, um, but mm. uh, they're put into orphanages at an early age. And this is true of many children who, um, whose early years are spent in Eastern European orphanages, uh, where they're in crowded conditions without a lot of uh, interaction with grown-ups and so the sen the neurological system is not given the opportunity to develop naturally, uh, and those children will will have sensory issues too. So it's either hereditary or environmental, or sometimes we just don't know. Sometimes it's it just happens, and uh, there's no one person or no one thing that can uh, be thought of as the source sometimes it mm. happens yeah and i think there's something also to about naming it and i and i believe that is probably a fundamental reason why your book has resonated so widely this year i read gabor mate's when the body says no uh -huh. and the idea that if you don't have the tools whether it's because you don't understand the current moment or you've been thrust in to the current moment and like you say we're so new in this modern era that if you don't have the tools to recognize mentally when your body's saying no, your body will say it for you. And that comes in the form of an illness or hitting a wall of some kind. Just, just the pleasure of reading Gabor's book and being able to name things now was so helpful. And I would imagine that some readers have given you similar feedback. Yes, that's definitely right. And it, um, uh, my book, I'm happy to say, has reprieved parents from their own um, uh, self-blame. Because imagine you um, imagine you have a baby and you love this baby, and this baby has tactile issues, which mean the baby can't process at, at uh, being touched. So the baby mm. doesn't know that when mommy picks baby up, that's a loving caress. The, the, the receptors in the baby's skin are saying, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What is this? This might be hostile. Uh, I must get away. So the neurological system has, it's like a traffic jam in the brain. It doesn't, it doesn't, things are not running smoothly. 
tactile messages come in, the brain is not able to say, this one's a good one. This, this caress is a good one. Uh, that caress is invasive and not a caress at all. That's harmful. The, the right. little baby can't make that distinction. And so the child arches and his back and pulls away and he retracts from mm. mommy's loving, loving um, attention. And then the mother thinks I've done something wrong. And mm. um, uh, my baby hates me. And, mm. and uh, so to find out that mom is doing everything right and it's the baby's system that is undeveloped and needs nurturing in a certain way that is so relaxing. And that's what right. I hear so often. You have made me realize I am not a bad parent, Carol. And I, Powerful. I hear that so often. It makes me want to weep. Powerful. Yeah. When you were doing the research process for this book, I imagine it was research intensive. Was there something you took away from that research that really blew your hair back? As you're saying that 16% of humans in general deal with some kind of sensory issue. Those are the kinds of stats that blow my hair back. Bill Wong in episode four of the podcast saying that 35% of autistic adults are unemployed in America one issue is he one issue he's really tackling that blew my hair back when you're doing the research process for the book is there a, was there a big takeaway throughout the course of that process or was it more a holistic experience of saying wow this really needs to be spoken to i think it was i think it was both i think it was finding out how many how many children have this problem it mm -hmm. was learning um that it's not discreet. I think that was that was a big one, Matt. Uh, now that I think back, um, when I wrote the book, I was think I thought I was writing about sensory processing issues yeah. and thinking about it as a discreet issue, like um, chickenpox. Okay, you like some people have sensory processing issues. I found out very soon after the book was published uh, that it sensory issues overlap with every other condition. I, and I will say every other condition. So parents with children with Down syndrome, for instance, or with um, cerebral palsy or with spina bifida or mm. uh, uh, any kind of other issue would say to me, my child also has sensory issues, and your book helped me understand that part. Um, so that was a that was that blew my hair back. My my expression is, it knocked my socks off. But I like yeah. it, I like yours. It blew my hair back. That that's right. So so I you know I was thinking I was going to be writing this book for a just a, a, a group of parents who and teachers who were dealing with kids with sensory processing disorder, I didn't realize mm. I would also be um, contributing to the understanding of parents with all kinds of other disorders as well. And then the autism aspect of it, I did a little research on autism when I was writing my book, um, and I did not understand the in the the it's not just overlap it's entwinement of those two disorders mm -hmm. everybody with autism has has sensory processing problems mm -hmm. not everybody with sensory issues has autism of course but i uh, that was a blow your hair back understanding when i when i understood that so i don't I'm uncomfortable when people say Carol Kranowitz is an expert on autism. I am mm. not. I am not. Um, I know a little bit about autism. I know a lot about sensory processing disorder. Um, but I do know that there is that very strong connection. If you're autistic, you have sensory issues, for sure. Mm. Right. 
And then if I'm getting the timeline correct, the in-sync child comes later. Yes. Yes. So um, I have a friend who um, I met uh, 40 years ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, um, I could... I. Uh, I was teaching at uh, this wonderful school. It's called St. Columba Nursery School in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Columba was an obscure Scottish saint. And uh, the church is named after him. So I was teaching at the preschool there and learning about these, uh, these out-of-sync kids, what made them tick or not tick. And... Uh, Working with the the uh, occupational therapist who I mentioned before, who came to our school and was and uh, teaching the teachers about sensory issues, and she was a consultant for us when we had kids who we had questions about them. So, so I was working with the therapist, and I considered myself an OT wannabe. I. I just mm -hmm. loved the whole learning what I did about occupational therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at that time, we, uh, this therapist and I were uh, screening children for sensory issues. Mm -hmm. And if the kids had um, evident sensory problems, we would suggest that they go to get occupational therapy. If they had what we considered soft issues, um, not so crystal clear, we would send them to Joy Newman, who had she Joy Newman is a conceptual mm -hmm. motor therapist, and she was she had a um program running here in the Washington area called Kids Moving Company. So kids who had difficulties with motor planning or um had uh rocky motor coordination uh, mm -hmm. that kind of kid would go to joy and she would fix them up so joy and i were not occupational therapists we were kind of on the fringe and we got friendly and um we had a lot of kids in common because i would send kids to her and anyway our, our friendship developed and then about uh, uh 10 years ago 12 years ago, we were taking a walk one day and talking, and we decided we needed to write a book about in-sync children mm. uh, because we wanted to get away from the negative, and we, want, we were, that was one thing. We wanted to get off the lecture circuit and the bookshelf that was devoted mm. to children with special needs. And what we wanted to do was get into the world of the child not yet identified with any needs, but whom we were worried about. And so we were, we have been worried about the kids who spend too much time with their computers and their two-dimensional worlds. And so, right. so we decided to put our heads together and start appealing to parents of typical children to say, get your kids moving, get your kids outdoors, get your kids doing heavy work activity and pushing and pulling and moving their bodies and relating to their environment, going through obstacle courses and mm -hmm. um, looking for challenges. And so we wrote um, the, we wrote the book called Growing in and excuse me, growing an in sync child. Mm -hmm. And then out of that emerged a collection of activity cards, the in sync activity cards, and the cards are also in a book form. And now, uh, hot off the press, so to speak, we have just um, produced 10 webinars it, oh, excellent. This is our InSync Child program. And four of the webinars give, the, give an introduction to child development, sensory processing, visual development, 
and perceptual motor skills. Um, and six of the 10 webinars are uh, each devoted to a, a very modest piece of equipment, such as a roll of masking tape or a few paper plates or pieces of rope. And so six of our webinars are what you do with rope um, for some in-sync activities. And these, these, uh, these 10 webinars are, um, we're going to be marketing them through a Canadian group called ECE Formula, ECE stands mm -hmm. for Early Childhood Education Formula. Mm -hmm. And also they're going to, they're going to um, be published, translated and published into Greek, French, Italian, and Spanish and spread around the Mediterranean world. And so That's really fantastic, Carol. When <laughs> when our listeners listen to this, they they see the word solutions tacked on to the end of the podcast. And so we want to plug these resources. We want people to be able to engage with the books. And now that we're in this strange world, the webinars, where can our listeners do that? Oh, thank you. Um the uh, the books, I think the easiest thing is to go to Amazon.com or Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. and um Type in Kranowitz, K R A N O W I T Z, or Newman, Joy Newman, uh, and then uh, the books will pop up. And the webinars, ECEformula.com. And um, actually, I think it's today that the first four webinars are going to go go up there we there have just been a few little pieces that have been needed to get that going and the the next six will be up in another week or so and in uh greece the uh uh website is upbility u p b i l i t y upbility and i think it's dot org no, it isn't. It's .net, upbility.net. And uh, uh, the materials have not been translated yet, so give them a month and then, and then go there. So we're really excited. And also our website, insyncchild.com, in and we're going to have information there for people too. All of this is just happening right as we speak, Matt. It's, this is wonderful timing. Well, I'm glad we got you when we did, Carol, and I'll make sure that I put live links to all of those resources in our show notes and on our blog so that our readers and listeners can access this material. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I, you've been very generous with your time, but I have one final question. Sure. Every time we wrap up one of these episodes, and this has been a great one, the final question is always about strategy. Um, everybody has a way to reduce the noise of the current era, whether it's getting outside for a walk, whether it's mindfulness, whatever your practice is, our readers and our listeners will be curious, Carol, what are your strategies to reduce the noise of the current time? Oh, well, I definitely have a very high movement quota, um, as do most children <laughs> and most adults, actually. I need at least an hour of vigorous activity every day or else you just don't want to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very crabby if I don't have my my exercise. So I was uh, I I swam I um uh, took uh, uh muscle conditioning classes at the gym. I I took Pilates exercise classes and then Corona virus happened. So now I just walk and that's, that's the only activity that I, that I do. It gets me outside. I walk three miles um, and then I'm, I'm okay. And I'll tell you, Matt, if I didn't do that, I really would, would be a basket case. I would, yep. I would yep. be a little lump. Um, so I, I suggest to everybody, even if they have not been big exercisers, um, if they haven't found 
that that is the solution, I highly recommend it. You don't have to walk fast. You just have to walk. Because remember, everyone who's listening, nature intends us to be moving all day long and not sitting. And when we move, we are in sync. Mm. Mm. That's a great way to end, Carol. (laughs) The fact that the fact that these have become so timeless as strategies, movement, mindfulness, awareness, it means they're true in some capacity because so many of us feel that so deeply. So I really appreciate you taking time to be a part of the Sensory Friendly Solutions podcast, and I can't wait for our listeners to hear this episode. Thank you, Matt. I am so happy that we've had this chance. Likewise, it's been a real pleasure, Carol. Be well, take care of yourself south of the border, and I hope we reconnect soon. I look forward to it, and be well, everyone who's listening. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay, Crystal, we're back for the reflection segment of episode five of the Sensory Friendly Solutions podcast, and I would be remiss if I didn't say another big thank you to Carol Stock Kranowitz for joining us on this podcast. New York Times bestseller, over a million copies sold, really impressive, really thoughtful, and I'm happy you've had a chance to listen to the podcast and reflect. And with that, let's get right into it. Let's talk about what was meaningful to you. Well, Matt, I have to say I was, uh, as I did with our guest uh, last week with Dr. Bill Wong, and again this week with uh, Carol Stark-Kranowitz, I was fangirling just a little bit uh, (laughs) because um, Carol's book, The Outer Sync Child, um, she, she actually, she shared, she published it, I think first published it in 1998. Mm. And I started, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I can't believe I'm going to confess this, but I started practicing as an occupational therapist in 1994. And mm-hmm. her book uh, changed my practice as an occupational therapist, uh, changed my understanding. She talked about there, there not being a lot of information out there. And I'm going to say even for occupational therapists, there, there, there was, but in terms of accessible information that really made practical our understanding of our of our bodies mm-hmm. and especially little bodies and children but of our bodies as people as as sensory beings and so her book that that book the out of sync child matt i it is the i'm going to say almost or consistently almost the only book I've, many good books have come since that I, I recommended to parents in practice. But even if parents weren't weren't readers and weren't uh, you know seeking out uh, extra information to learn about their child, I, I would still recommend it. And our you know uh, many a, a local library has it or has access to it, and it you know mm-hmm. it's still it's that foundational. So to have her on the podcast, uh, to have her share her insights. Um, and to be able to to listen into her brilliance in making uh, simple what is sometimes feels complex and overwhelming uh, was an absolute delight for me. That's the that's the biggest thing I think with science communication, and why it's become such a big industry right now. So you start practicing in '94. Sure, there's technical material. Sure, OTs are sharing information, but that one document that becomes that makes the the sector or the industry accessible is why to me so many voices like neil degrasse tyson for example are are blowing up because you've made it consumable to people who don't know the technical jargon and one thing one thing that really blew my hair back was and i was going to ask you about this in the reflection period is yeah what is it what is it that happens when you name something so yeah. in 1998, the Out of Sync Child comes out and parents by the thousands and millions ended up buying the book, but parents by the tens of thousands are contacting her and saying, yep. this is my life. I now can yeah. name this. Yeah. What is it about naming it that gives us this kind of freedom to then address it? I think even, you know, if we reflect a little bit on, on what Carol called the book, right? Um, the out of sync child. It's not um, 
the, the problem with your child. It's not, um, you know, this massive thing um, that's that's not understood. It's not complex vocabulary. It's just just even saying, look, your, your child's out of sync. And, and an understanding that we as people, that's something we can relate to. We can mm-hmm. all relate to. We have, we immediately have um, an image, an understanding, a feeling, a sense, no pun intended, of what being out of sync is, but also understanding, um, also it, it in that concept, uh, going to a place where we we can imagine also being in sync again, right? It, it's sort yeah. of just just even those simple words, that simple uh, title, uh, makes it feel like this is this is something we can we can grasp, right? We're we're right. we and are we walk yeah. the road towards a better tomorrow or at least understanding the idea of what it means to be out of sync yeah and we're yeah and we're giving words to it that are accessible that we use in our daily life right Mm -hmm. and a a little later in 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 the podcast uh carol introduced you know some of I'll say a little bit more of our our scientific vocabulary about our sense of proprioception and our our vestibular sense and giving examples, our vestibular sense is our sense of balance and our proprioceptive sense is our sense of movement. Uh, But just even just making those things very relatable, um, understandable, um, and that if we understand a problem in a way that we can relate to it, it, it helps us get to, it helps everyone get to a solution. And While that, you were speaking, yeah. I wrote accessible language. Yeah. And the reason yeah. I wrote that is because it seems to me that Carol may have had an advantage mm-hmm. being a bit of an industry outsider. Yes. She said, hmm, there's a big gap here, specifically for parents. I want to research a book that fills that gap. And the reason I wrote down accessible language is because a mentor of mine once ran my writing on my technical field through a program that shows you how accessible your language is. And it was terribly inaccessible because I was in an industry insider. So do you think she maybe had an advantage being a researcher and coming at it from the perspective of how parents digest this information? Yeah, very much so. And I think just her, her years, she talked a lot about um, observing her observations as a preschool teacher. And I really loved, she, she said this, and it's, it struck me. She said she was really encouraging people to learn how to be detectives. Um, and literally that, that just on, on, um, on our website, on the Sensory Friendly Solutions website, we, we literally we have a download for parents when they sign up for a newsletter and and my download is called like become a, I, I, I tell parents become a parent detective that's what you are um, you're uh, seeking to understand and making that in for, as you said that information just accessible and relatable makes all the difference uh, Matt I'll tell you you know I we, we do a lot of blogging. We blog about the podcasts mm-hmm. on, on our website and have done a lot of blogging if you go there. And I, I have the same uh, challenge. I'll write a blog post and uh, I'll, the same sort of feedback will, will, will come back before I publish. Mm-hmm. You have to, uh, you know, make the vocabulary, just make the information uh, something that, that uh, people can, can relate to and understand and, and then have meaning in, in their daily life. Certainly. And that download you speak of will include that link yeah, in the show yeah. notes for this episode. I, I want to hear your feedback further on the second half of the episode. But one thing that I thought was interesting was how we're seeing through ways now that we're into episode five of how this all connects. Yeah. And one of the things that I believe I brought up was Dr. Bill Wong feeling like looking back in hindsight at his childhood and understanding the out of sync child once he had OT training. Yeah. He said, wow, this is me. And Carol was like, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in reader feedback, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. It, she said, again, she I, something else I highlighted that that links in. Um, she, she talked about children learning through play mm. and, you know, and, and for Bill, 
uh, speaking about his play and his play patterns and habits as a child with autism, undiagnosed with autism. And Carol talked a lot about children not being in sync with the other children in their play um, and how, you know, really children's that the strength and the importance of development and learning through play um, and how being out of sync, your body, your senses, being out of sync, how much that impacted um, play and development uh, and how much she worked really hard to um, identify when there were problems, and and she talked a little bit about, uh, you know, referrals to occupational therapy, but also referrals to other solutions to kind of uh, prevent and 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 preempt uh, problems from happening. And I, I really uh, valued that that advice, right? Yeah, certainly. And she mentions in that in that same vein that as humans we do have this high movement quota. And right now, one of the things that I think or she thinks is really compelling to talk about during during the pandemic, and we've had this mentioned by Maureen Benny of the Autism Awareness Center and several others, is that lack of physical stimulation in this moment. Yeah, yeah. She, you know, talking about the movement and and being outside circles back to what Dr. Gander said in the first podcast and how nature bathing is mm. you know I'll, I'll describe it as being very sensory rich it is um, but that is incredibly important and as we think about you know speaking about the the pandemic and the and uh, COVID it's highlighted something else some words that really struck me um, is that the frailty of what we've built Right, the a little bit of it's exposed a little bit of the the frailty um, mm. of our lives right now, and uh, uh, why we're having these these conversations to to shine a light on that and to shine a light on on the solutions. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the Sensory Friendly Solutions Podcast. This is episode five. It's the innovation segment. We do not want you to leave a single episode of the Sensory Friendly Solutions podcast without having something to go and do. We've talked about it a lot on the podcast. Carol and I talked about it, how in this moment, we're not as engaged as we once were with the world, both, both physically and mentally. And as a music movement and drama teacher for 25 years, this is a huge goal of Carol's to communicate how we do this in this moment. And so the innovation segment is simple. What we first have to do is if we're in the position to, we need to pick up the out of sync child. It's Carol's first book, over a million copies sold, blurbed in the New York Times. You can find that on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or go directly to the website. That's the outofsyncchild.com, and we'll include that in our show notes for this episode. Further to that, there are more books. There's the Out of Sync Child Has Fun. There's the In Sync Child series that is a response to the Out of Sync Child and its success. Carol has upcoming events. She has talks, articles, more resources, and you'll find all of that at the Out of Sync Child. Dot com. It's the theme of our innovation segment. We want you to get out there and act. And this is a great way to do that. We'll see you back on the podcast for episode six. Thank you to our sponsor, Taking It Global, ensuring that youth around the world are actively engaged and connected in shaping a more inclusive, peaceful, and sustainable world. As part of their Rising Youth Initiative, they're looking for young people who are inspired with ideas and ready to take action through youth-led community service grants. Head to risingyouth.ca to learn more and to become the next Rising Youth grant recipient. The podcast is also supported by New Brunswick Community College as part of the Community Resource Awareness During and After COVID-19 Applied Research Project, funded by the New Brunswick Innovation Foundation. 
Learn more about NBCC's efforts to transform lives and communities at NBCC.ca. The Sensory Friendly Solutions Podcast is produced by me, Matt George, is engineered by the great Zachary Pelche, and is part of the Unsettled Media Podcast Network.